Now, the population has declined uh, seriously. It's one third what it was 100 years ago. On the other hand, the amount of people living in each dwelling has also considerably dropped. I found statistics showing 20 people living in one house, small house. <laughs> this is the Market Square. It's very pleasant today. It's the scene of a great deal of suffering during the Second World War. It looks very typical of a Jewish community in Poland, even though many of these houses have been done up or you know, are in fact new. The street up there has a small museum of Jewish life, it's privately owned, and one needs to contact the owner to actually see it. That building in front is the synagogue, which dates to around 1860. It was uh, vandalized considerably by the Nazis, and after the war, it was used uh, as a store. It was done up, though, in, in, in the 1950s. It was uh, saved from destruction. But uh, you can see from it's a pretty large building. We don't see many synagogues of that size in Poland and you've got some of the locals drinking outside it. This shows the rear of the synagogue. The synagogue was built on the site of a former one, a wooden one. The land here behind it was the cemetery. Now it's quite unusual to have a synagogue and a cemetery uh, next to each other. Uh, the local Jewish population was given this land and sometime historically. So the Jewish community also owned uh, other buildings which it constructed uh, in the first years of uh, Polish independence which were in this area. Uh, there was also a library. The communists uh, I also had a library somewhere around here, I don't quite know where, even though the Communist Party was actually illegal in Poland as it was in 1926. It was quite difficult for well, everybody uh, in, in the interwar period, but oh, particularly for um, Jews. Here in 1927 there was a police chief uh, turned up, I uh, um, don't quite know how he was appointed, but he seems to me a pretty nasty character because he would actually uh, insult people in the streets, he, he would have his, set his dog on people, for example there's a, um, there was a Jewish boy who's 12 years old who was later in need of serious medical treatment because the police officer had set his dog on him. In another case there was um, the police officer he attacked somebody, include, a group of people including one Mr. Greenblum, and uh, Mr. Greenblum then uh, took the police uh, commandant to court. Now, another policeman had actually asked the commandant to uh, stop hitting uh, the Jews, but he just uh, take them, he just ignored them. Now, uh, Mr. Greenblum was summoned to see the police commandant and was warned if he didn't drop his legal case, then he would face serious problems. Mr. Greenblum uh, went ahead. However, the irony here is that the judge then fined Mr. Greenblum and he got a 2,000 zloty fine for not showing um, sufficient respect to a Polish police officer. Now, uh, 2,000 zlotys was then a great deal of money. To give you an idea uh, what you could do with that, I mean, a, a good cow would cost between 200, 300 zlotys, something like that. Uh, a very good horse uh, would cost about a thousand zloty, so it's like cost of two very good horses. Diesel then cost, if I recall correctly, was about, I think it was 46 grosha a litre, where in petrol was about uh, 70 grosha a litre. Uh, so that gives you a, a you could buy 4,000 litres of uh, diesel, for example. This is the market square. 
scene of great tragedy. It may seem very difficult on a lovely summer day like today when there's a, a wedding going on, there's ice cream being sold, there's people going into the shops, but uh, and there's the strange noise from the uh, fountain in front of me. When the war started, there were roughly 3,100 Jews uh, in Klimontel, but this was added to uh, refugees, particularly those that came from the area of uh, Rouge. Uh, it's quite normal for people to leave larger towns and then to seek residence in smaller villages because they thought they would uh, hide better, if you like, in smaller villages. Also, they would be able to get access to food. People were frightened of living in the cities uh, and uh, the hunger that uh, happened there. Now, I believe that Klimontov was occupied by the Germans on the 9th of September. There are other dates, such as 11th and the, or the 13th of September, which have been given, but I believe it was the 9th, and I believe that based on the location of uh, German units in the area, so that I could be wrong, and I might actually change my mind about that. What happened uh, was when the Germans arrived sometime uh, around 1400, uh, in the afternoon, they gathered all the males of between 14 to 60 and they kept them in this square. And the German Wehrmacht commander warned them that the uh, there was uh, German units were going to be passing through and for them not to uh, do anything. And if anything happened, then the entire population would suffer. They were kept here about three hours and then they were dismissed. This was both Jewish and Catholic, although of course the majority of the population were Jewish anyway. However, as they allowed people to disperse, some shots were fired and three people died. Uh, two Jews and one uh, Catholic uh, peasant. While from the military occupation, many of the shops uh, that we see around here now were actually plundered by Wehrmacht troops. Now, in the, towards the end of October 1939, uh, civ civilian uh, rule uh, became, so it was no longer in the military application. And one of the very first things that did happen was uh, that they were ordered to form a Judenrat, uh, a Jewish council, and uh, which was done. And it, now, in saint Domierge, the local occupation authorities uh, seized 10 people and demanded a ransom of 100,000 zloty, which had to be paid by the Jewish communities. Uh, 12,500 zloty had to be paid by people from Klimontu. And uh, if this money was not paid, then the people who were taken hostage would be murdered the money was collected and the hostages were released. Now hostages weren't always released, it was quite common for the Nazis just to murder the hostages. German troops uh, took up uh, residence in the town, they were located next to the monastery. See there, the church, here's the Dominican monastery, the former Dominican monastery, because it ceased to be a monastery in 1864. And this building is a school, and uh, it was a school, and this building, or one which stood on its site, I believe, was the German army billet. This is where the troops were. Now, in most cases in villages, the German army didn't bother to have a presence, but here it uh, did. How long it was actually used for, I'm unable to say. State was 400 SS uh, stationed not so far from here, according to the memorial book, and the person in charge was an SS captain, was called uh, Kneipfel. Now, I've been unable to locate any more information about this person. He, like many, noted for brutality, noted for a total disregard for human life and uh, comfort. And one thing that he'd do, for example, was to uh, not only to steal things from houses that he went to, but also to, for example, to smash the windows, to make it colder for the people. Now, obviously the Jewish population did not have money for heating. Uh, it may have been burning old furniture, it may have tried to get wood from whatever means it could do, but that was a very risky thing to do, and wood burns very fast. Uh, 
This idea was just to cause suffering. Many people did die of diseases related to cold and uh, the, the inability of the body to protect itself. But uh, as far as I can see, there wasn't starvation here. Uh, there may have been diseases like typhus, which are caused by unsanitary conditions, but not to the extent you get it, for example, in the large urban ghettos. At the beginning of 1940, kidnappings for taking people away for slave labor began, and uh, people were taken to a quarry, which, which is about, what, 12 kilometers or so from here, a place called Mienzeborg, uh, usually no transport was laid on, so had, people had to walk there and then walk back again. Now, people were also taken to other places such as Skarzysko Kamiena, uh, where there were armament factories. Now, the armament factories there were not liquidated until the summer of 1944, and that could possibly be one of the reasons why people survived. That was the best hope for survival with hindsight. Of course, it probably didn't seem so at the time. One of the problems with forced labour everywhere was that people who were forced to work uh, often included the rich and they were able to buy their way out of it. So the burden fell upon the poor. But sometimes also the poor didn't want to work and there was one day when nobody turned up for work. Uh, so as a result of this, on 6th of August 1940, early in the morning, uh, a, the German police came around and uh, forced everybody here to this market square where I am now and uh, beat them, took them to the, uh, to the quarry and then uh, increased security to such an extent that people uh, wouldn't try to escape again. Well, that was the idea. Um, it didn't actually completely work because there were people who did escape and in one case, uh, when one person escaped, they rounded up his family and murdered them. Another thing the uh, occupiers did was, and it doesn't make much sense, uh, but in March 1940, let's just say that in the very early days of the occupation, they went into the Jewish library, which was somewhere down there, helped themselves, to, uh, loaded all the books in a lorry, took them to saint Damierge and burned them. More Jews found themselves here, either because they were rounded up from smaller communities uh, by the Germans who brought here, or sent to places such as Vienna, and uh, this brought the total of Jews living here to around 4,000 people. On the 30th of October 1942, the Germans aided by Ukrainian or Travniki auxiliaries and Polish police collected all the Jews in Klimontov into this square here, about 4,000 people. They did a selection for about 150 young, fit, uh, fit looking I should say, males were taken out and they were sent to labor camps. The others were marched to a place called Zwota, which is some distance from here, uh, probably took them all day. And from there they were taken to a place called Nalpjezhna, which is to the east of Sandomierge. And from there they were loaded onto trains and taken to Treblinka. Now, the uh, journey to Nalpjezhna, I, I suspect it was on foot. So I cannot believe that they've managed to find transport for so many people. I don't know uh, exactly how it uh, took place, but uh, certainly it was done in two stages. First one was water, next one to navigation. It's about 40 kilometers. That's a long distance uh, to go on foot in a uh, weakened condition. Uh, there were some people who came back after the war, unfortunately, in March 1945, they were murdered by anti-Semites. And uh, after that, nobody uh, tried further. But uh, as you can see, the synagogue was done up in the 1950s. And there is a gentleman who, over there who runs a museum of Jewish life. And occasionally, people uh, do uh, come here.
not much is known about uh, the ghetto. The ghetto, of course, was open. It wasn't uh, sealed. Very few of the ghettos were actually sealed. Most of them were open, but I mean, it was absolute. It was absolutely forbidden to actually leave the town, and that would be on the pain of death. Uh, there was a Jewish police here, uh, which was founded in, I think, March 1940. Eight people. So there you have the tragedy of the Jewish population of Klimantov. That is why the population is now only one third of what it was before. And that is a pattern which we see throughout Central Europe. If you're interested, you can see more, lots more on this on my YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash Alan Heath. I have also, if you're interested in travel to places like this, you can see them on my travel page, which is www.motorhomefulltime.com. And there's more information there.